Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Kong Wang, and I'm from the <laughs> System Technologies and Engineering team at Baidu. So today I'm going to talk about the linear kernel uh, uh, auto tuning. So uh, this is the agenda today. I know it's a lot of information, so I will try to uh, finish everything uh, uh, as soon as possible, so we could have uh, more time uh, for discussion. Okay, so uh, before we start, so the first thing I, uh, first thing first, so the first thing I need to uh, 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 clarify is, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on machine learning, so don't ask me machine learning questions. And also, in case you wonder, so uh, uh, if I'm trying to uh, kill our jobs, no, I'm not. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there are still a lot of work we need to do here. And uh, even if we automate everything, I'm pretty sure the uh, uh, knowledge from engineers is still uh, required. Okay, uh, let's go back to this topic. So the first one is, you know, uh, the first important question we need to answer is, you know, why we need auto tuning uh, anyway. So I think there are three uh, reasons we need to consider uh, auto tuning. So the first one is, you know, when we tune the performance. So this is a very uh, time cons uh, consuming effort. So it consumes a lot of uh, uh, engineering effort to evaluate the performance, to understand the different parameters, to understand the, the different metrics. So if we could automate, if we could automate the entire process, so that means we could liberate all the engineering effort, and you know we could focus on something different. And the second thing is, uh, uh, even if we uh, when we uh, uh, for our uh, uh, performance engineers or uh, uh, kernel engineers when we tune the performance. The, there are a lot of difficult decisions we need to make because there are a lot of different trade-offs we need to uh, uh, think about. For example, whether we need to treat uh, a CPU uh, with memory or whether we need to uh, uh, treat the uh, performance with, you know, uh, for example, uh, power consumption. So a lo lot of uh, uh, trade-offs. So it's not uh, that easy for uh, our performance engineer or kernel engineer anyway. So if we could have some other way uh, and automated way to make a decision for us and hopefully better decision and uh, in some uh, uh, quicker way, I think that this will also uh, uh, benefit us a, a, a lot. And uh, the uh, uh, last point is actually I do believe with machine learning, we possibly have could find uh, 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 more op optimal solutions than the currently uh, 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 method we use for uh, some specific workload. And uh, 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 briefly speaking, there are two categories of uh, uh, audit tuning. The first one is the Ruby's one, I think most of us are already familiar with. And the second one is the machine learning one, which is uh, 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 not very uh, 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 popular. This is why I uh, want to discuss here today. So the second question we need to think about is, you know, why do we need to further machine learning at all, right? So to, however, to answer this question, we need to go back to the very beginning question. So what is machine learning anyway, right? So uh, actually this, uh, this question is not that uh, uh, answer. So uh, it's not that uh, hard to answer. So uh, I'm not a uh, uh, machine learning expert. So th this diagram actually, in my opinion, is the easiest way to understand what uh, machine learning is, you know, for our, you know, traditional uh, 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 programmer. So, you know, when we, uh, 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 we, when we use the traditional programming, you know, we have some data as an input. We need to write some programs uh, 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 to uh, to uh, get the input, and of course we need to uh, execute the programs on, typically on a CPU, mm -hmm. and you know get some output from the uh, uh, computation. So this is what uh, we are all familiar with. Uh, and how is machine learning different? So machine learning is very, very different from this uh, uh, point of view. So uh, machine learning actually takes the uh, uh, the data. The data actually is both input and uh, output from the histor uh, historical uh, 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 information. And uh, the machine learning actually will 
do some computation, typically on GPU, and it will produce something like a program. Actually, typically, this is what we call it machine learning model. So this, this is very uh, 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 different with the, the tra traditional programming. And with that, I do believe machine learning could help in uh, our opportunity case. So let's take a look. So uh, how does the machine learning process uh, uh, look like? So, so basically, uh, briefly speaking, this is how the machine learning process look like. So it's uh, very uh, simplified. So we have some uh, uh, different features to tune, and we have some uh, target to meet. And our machine learning engineers, they need to write some algorithms to train uh, the machine learning model. At the end, we get some model, and with that model, when we have some new uh, features, we could actually use that model to predict some uh, you know, target value. So briefly speaking, this is how the uh, machine learning process uh, uh, works. So why do we need machine learning for open system, especially for linear kernel here? So actually, uh, I think one of the uh, great explanation is uh, I quoted here is from uh, Jeff Lee. Uh, uh, from Google, I think he runs the uh, uh, machine learning for uh, system workshop. So this is one of the uh, the quotes I uh, uh, selected from uh, him. So computer systems are filled with heuristics. So I think this is also very very true for the operating system for uh, especially for uh, linear kernel. So heuristics, uh, I do believe they have some room. Of course, they exist for a, a rather long time. We still have a lot of uh, uh, heuristics in the linear kernel source code today. So they do work well in general. Of course in general, right? So uh, I don't think they work uh, that well for some specific case. So th this is why we need to consider uh, uh, we, whether we should generalize this kind of uh, heuristic for some specific case so we could get a better performance for this uh, uh, specific workload. And generally speaking, uh, the heuristics, they don't take uh, consideration of any uh, uh, particular pattern or any uh, uh, sufficient context, in my opinion. With machine learning, actually, we could uh, uh, open this door to uh, learn these different patterns. And as long as we feed the, uh, sufficient data, I do believe they could uh, 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 consider uh, uh, a lot of more context. So uh, let's take a look at what we have the, the heuristics today in the linear kernel. So I select three different cases in linear kernel from three different subsystems. So just to give you some quick idea about you know what kind of heuristics we have today. So uh, the first one is the read ahead one. So uh, we need to decide you know how much memory we need to prefetch from the storage into our main memory. So this is one of the logic we use in the linear in the kernel source code to decide how much memory we need uh, to prefetch. So pretty much, you know, as you can see from the comments, we assume it's a sequential access. Of course, we don't know for sure, right? And the second one actually is uh, from the networking. So uh, uh, at the core part of networking, especially related to the TCP IP stack, so the congestion control is definitely one of the most important uh, part of the TCP IP stack. So here, it, the, this code actually shows how we uh, calculated the TCP congestion window with the TCP cubic uh, uh, congestion control algorithm. So as, as you can see, you know, uh, still a lot of heuristics here. Uh, the third one I have is uh, uh, is related to NUMA scheduling. So when we need to schedule some tasks, we need to make some decision whether we should move this task to some pref uh, uh, preferred NUMA node. So this is one of the decision making uh, uh, code I selected from the uh, uh, scheduled code. So as you can see, we based on, we uh, pretty much based on some uh, 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 retrying uh, mechanism and try to guess whether this is a better, better decision. So this kind of heuristics, heuristics exist for a rather long time in linear kernel for decades, especially you know like the TCP congestion control, like the uh, 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 reader head one. So is there anything we could do to get rid of 
these kind of heuristics. I think it's, this is possible. So uh, if we take a, uh, if we take a, a look at this problem from a different angle, so to see how uh, we uh, tune linear kernel, uh, 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 how the linear kernel tuning uh, evolves uh, uh, from uh, uh, the beginning until nowadays, you know, we have uh, the EVPF. So uh, of course, uh, uh, in the beginning, probably we have uh, probably uh, more uh, you know hard coded values, and and I think today we still have some hard coded values. For example, you know in networking, the byte queue limit is they intentionally uh, hard code the value because they don't want to bother users to tune the the parameters. Yeah, and uh, of course, I think everyone is familiar with the uh, how Linux kernel uh, expose different parameters, you know, like uh, proc FS, CSFS, you know, if you are networking people, you know, you, we use Netlink. So, uh, essentially, this kind of interface is pre, uh, primarily, you know, to basically to update some kernel values within somewhere in, in the kernel. So, uh, it, we, we, which is also very uh, simple. And now we have eBPF. I think you know from this angle, actually eBPF makes a lot of sense because you know eBPF not only with eBPF you 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 could not only actually you know just a simple simple update some values, but you could also write some uh, programs literally to replace some you know kernel code with your own logic. So essentially, I think eBPF is definitely a great idea from this angle. However, I do believe we could do more than eBPF because why? Because you know we still need programmers to write eBPF code to to make this happen. So, what we could go further? Like what we what we could actually maybe we could uh, use machine learning to uh, uh, generate some learned program without any uh, engineering effort to 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 get this. So this is actually the point I want to make today. So I, I do believe, you know, with the diagram I showed in the beginning for the uh, machine learning introduction, this definitely totally make a lot of sense. And for the implementation part, so I do, uh, 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 I don't have any specific idea yet. However, I do believe the kernel machine learning is one of the possible uh, implementation. So here is a quick summary. So why do we need a machine learning for operating system, uh, specifically for linear kernel? So I do. So uh, as a quick summary, uh, machine learning algorithm could actually help us to explore uh, 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 more solutions than the Ruby's approaches. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, there are four uh, uh, areas I do believe the machine learning could help the uh, operating system in general. The first one is the prediction. So if we could uh, do some prediction based on the historical data, that means you know we will we could actually have uh, uh, more knowledge for the uh, tuning for the uh, uh, analysis. And the second one is the root cause analysis. So this is also a very big category for the machine learning. Uh, so the, the root cause analysis actually, in my opinion, could also help us to, for example, to identify the performance bottleneck, or maybe with a large language model, could also help us to narrow down the, you know, the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, bug fix as well, maybe possibly. And uh, the, uh, the third one is uh, uh, classification. So this one actually, if we could uh, cl clar uh, uh, classify different problems into different categories, and we could uh, use the divide and concur to solve a different category of the problem in different ways, this could also help us a lot, I, I do believe. It. And the last one is uh, uh, related to the topic today is optim optimization. So we want to leverage machine learning to uh, uh, recommend some best of the uh, parameters for some specific workload. So let's take a look at the uh, optimization part. So uh, for this problem, I think the, the best definition is, and the simplest one in my opinion is this. So our goal here actually is to try, try to find the best set of uh, uh, parameters, let's, let's call them X. 
and uh, we want to optimize some target uh, metrics, let's call it web. So with different combinations of you know different uh, 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 parameters, we get a different values uh, for the web. And definitely our goal is to find the optimal uh, 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 value for the web to meet our uh, 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 performance target. And for the X here, actually, you know, there are uh, uh, tons of parameters in the Linux kernel. And uh, for example, the TCP initial congestion window, the watermark scale factor. So, um, and for the performance metrics, actually, the, uh, it's a very broad uh, 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 concept. So, for example, you know, we could, uh, uh, for different workload, we use different uh, ways to, uh, different metrics to measure the performance. Some workload we use uh, latency, some workload we care about throughput, and some workload we care about the resource in, uh, utilization, like the CPU usage. So, I do believe the machine learning could actually uh, help this problem, and there are two uh, uh, kind of approaches for this uh, uh, problem. So uh, basically, there are two categories here. The first one is the stateless, and the second one is the stateful. So they are significantly different here. So this is why I needed to uh, highlight the difference before we continue. So as a uh, uh, so uh, as a quick summary, so the stateful one actually requires uh, to memorize the 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 past input and feed feed it back to the uh, next iteration of the tuning. So it's it requires Require multiple iterations to get the the uh, 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 op optimal uh, uh, performance, uh, while the stateless one, uh, uh, of course, does not have this kind of uh, 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 iterations. So uh, they, there are different uh, uh, machine learning algorithms to fit into these uh, uh, two uh, uh, categories. For the stateless one, you know, the, I think the typical one is the linear regression, which is already used by the uh, adaptive MM tuning and uh, and also the random search and grid search. Actually, we also explored the uh, um, uh, random search when we set up the uh, uh, NGX tuning in our specific case, I will uh, mention later. Uh, the second category is the stateful one, which is more complicated. So this one actually, is, uh, uh, it, uh, it, uh, as I mentioned, it requires multiple uh, iterations to get the optimal uh, uh, performance. And uh, during the, these iterations, it may have some regression as well. So what does this mean? This means we need to have some guidance for the uh, 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 optimization. So we need to talk, tell the uh, optimization algorithm, hey, uh, we're heading to the right direction. So to answer this question, actually, this, this will uh, introduce another uh, piece of puzzle here. So how could we evaluate the performance automatically? So you know, typically we rely on the performance engineer or the kernel engineers to evaluate the performance. You know, whether with some diagram or some charts or uh, 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 some or some data. However, this definitely uh, uh, does not work you know, when we need to interact with the machine learning algorithm. So we need to have some automated way, and we actually use some statistical, uh, uh, statistical tools to uh, utilize this. And uh, uh, briefly speaking, th these tools actually is simply to uh, compare different data distributions, and we still need the uh, uh, engineer's knowledge to tell the, uh, the, the statistical tool, hey, which is the, the best. And, uh, and of course, there are different uh, you know, uh, statistical uh, uh, tests for the uh, performance uh, evaluation as well, so I'm not an expert here, so I will go, go over this uh, 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 very quickly. So, uh, and uh, I think maybe it's the time we uh, we should uh, uh, take a look at some uh, specific use case. So the first use case we have is the the dummy one. So it's a, a very simple and it does not require any machine learning stuff. So that, uh, in case if, if you are not familiar what is Daemon, I think uh, Daemon is pretty much you know, the, uh, a new subsystem for the uh, memory uh, access uh, monitoring and uh, uh, optimization. So we leverage Daemon 
to tune our uh, uh, MySQL memory. So, uh, and uh, the uh, Diamond actually offers uh, 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 multiple schemes, and each of the scheme actually have uh, uh, different parameters. So at the end, we have a lot of uh, uh, parameters to tune. So fortunately, we already have some uh, 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 adapters available to uh, search for the uh, uh, best scheme. And we actually modify the, the simple adapter for our uh, 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 purpose, which is for the MySQL. And we evaluate different uh, schemes based on the uh, MySQL uh, uh, performance uh, uh, metrics. And uh, uh, fortunately, the simplest one already uh, uh, worked for us. So because we don't have any uh, you know, uh, uh, swapping, actually we have to leverage the ZRAM to do this kind of you know, uh, uh, swapping and to offload or compress the pages uh, to save the memory. So even with this, at the end, we got about 30% uh, uh, 30, uh, 30 of the memory uh, uh, reduction. I think this is also very impressive. Uh, the second use case we have actually is a complicated one. So the, for this case, we want to tune the performance for the uh, Nginx server. So we set up some uh, uh, HTTP latency benchmark for the Nginx server, and we hand selected uh, uh, 16 kernel parameters to tune here. And uh, to evaluate the performance, so we got some diff different uh, data distributions. So like I mentioned, we use some statistical, uh, uh, statistical tools to uh, evaluate the performance here, just to uh, give you some uh, a quick idea about you know, how the uh, uh, distribution uh, uh, look like. And uh, uh, here is the final result we, we have. I think this is the most interesting part. So uh, I think the, uh, uh, if, you took a, if you take a look at the baseline, so the baseline we selected is very interesting. So because we want, uh, our goal actually is not only actually to uh, beat the default uh, 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 value uh, uh, provided by the uh, linear kernel, actually we want to beat the, uh, the linear kernel engineers so we actually asked one of our uh, linear kernel engineers on our team and to spend about 30 minutes to tune you know, this kind of 16 parameters. Yeah, I know 16, uh, 30 minutes is not that uh, you know, sufficient or long, but uh, hopefully, hopefully it's sufficient you know, as a, a, a comparison. And, uh, on top, and then we use the uh, uh, Bayesian optimization and we apply different uh, uh, acquisition functions and we compare the performance of the, the different functions here. So the final result is also very interesting. So the last one actually eventually produced uh, uh, more optimal uh, uh, results than our uh, uh, kernel engineer. And uh, more interestingly, actually, you know, the uh, machine learning algorithm takes a shorter time than the uh, kernel engineer. So this is very interesting. So uh, the next topic I want to bring up is you know the kernel machine learning. So what is the kernel machine learning? So this this concept is not actually introduced by me. So it, actually I found this kind of concept in uh, uh, multiple papers. So the most impressive one is this paper: the uh, uh, kernel machine learning uh, using machine learning to improve the storage system. So uh, uh, I think the uh, uh, I. Uh, uh, this diagram could explain what the uh, current machine learning is. So briefly speaking, so we want to uh, uh, bring the machine learning into the kernel. So why, why do we need to do that? So of course, you know, this, this, this is not a, 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 an easy problem. So there are different you know, pros and cons. So if we do the machine learning in the uh, user space, we definitely have a lot of freedom. We don't have, a, uh, literally, we don't have any restriction, right? However, if we do this in the kernels, uh, uh, I think the game is will uh, uh, change significantly. Because you know, kernel space have a lot of uh, kind of restriction. For example, you know, the, I think the most important one is the floating point. Uh, in kernel space, we could use floating point in some restricted way. However, if we use the floating point, that will bring you know, some additional uh, overhead to the uh, linear kernel. And more importantly, actually, you know, in the linear, in Euro space, we don't need to uh, 
uh, worry that much about you know the CPU and the memory overhead. You know, which typically uh, uh, come together with machine learning. However, you, if we bring this in the kernel space, this that means you know we will not have this kind of tolerance. For example, if we use a lot of uh, a CPU in the kernel, that, that means we will possibly trigger you know some like a software lock lockup or something like that, right? And of course, the last thing is, you know, the Linux kernel actually, our, our machine learning engineer asked me to add this point. I think uh, uh, he's right, actually. You know, Linux kernel actually is written in C, uh, currently mostly in C. I think, uh, you know, we are um, uh, moving to Rust maybe a little bit. However, you know, our machine learning uh, uh, engineers, they typically use Python or Java, you know, to write their machine learning algorithm. So if we force them to uh, switch to C, so this could be uh, another uh, uh, consideration we need to think about. And of course, you know, uh, there are also some advantages if we uh, want to do the machine learning within the kernel. For example, if we do everything within the kernel, that means we no longer need to transfer the data between kernel space and user space, which usually requires copy. And uh, of course, if we do this in the kernel space, that means you know we could do uh, everything online and you know in some uh, 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 in a more uh, real time way. So speaking of the floating point, other than the overhead, there are still some other considerations we need to think about. For example, if we could actually choose not to use uh, the floating point. Uh, and of course, you know, this is, uh, we need to trade off. If we don't uh, want to bother the floating point, let's say if we use a, a fixed point computation, that means probably we need to uh, lose some you know, uh, accuracy or uh, uh, stability. So there is no one right answer. So I think this, this kind of question largely depends on the user case. So it depends on some specific use case, whether you don't, maybe you don't uh, care much about the accuracy, right? If that is the case, I think it is definitely possible to uh, uh, use, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, to avoid the floating point of phone. I'm using EPPF to do this kind of machine learning. And of course, if, really, if we really want to use the floating point, I think it, it is possible because we already have some uh, code specifically in the crypto subsystem. We already see a lot of you know, uh, kernel FPU begin kernel FPU, uh, uh, FPU end. And uh, we do believe the kernel machine learning uh, will also uh, open a, a, a door for us to explore the machine learning in uh, a different uh, scenarios. So the page free page one is what I already mentioned, you know, to prefetch, uh, whether it is to prefetch the memory from the storage to the memory or from, you know, some remote storage to the local. local. And of course, it could also help the uh, 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 scheduling, whether it's CPU scheduling, whether it's IO scheduling, whether it's uh, NUMA scheduling. And also, it could help the uh, cache, uh, uh, caching eviction. So there is uh, some research related to learned index. I, I think they could help uh, this uh, category of the problem. And also, like you know, some other user cases I mentioned, the network congestion control, the intrusion detection, I think we could could also explore the current machine learning. So uh, as a quick conclusion, so I, uh, we do believe machine learning is important for the uh, uh, oper uh, um, operating system tuning, whether we want to do the uh, machine learning in the Euro space or in the kernel space. And, uh, and although there are many limitations we discussed, and I do believe the kernel machine learning one is not only possible, but also necessary for some case. So this is all I have today. So this is not my <laughs> own work. So I want to uh, use this opportunity to thank my uh, uh, colleagues. They are not here. However, you know, this is a team effort. So I want to thank uh, Jasmine, Chris, Bobby, and Yaxin for uh, all this uh, kind of related work. Thank you. Questions, comments?
So in your Nginx example, you pre-selected 16 features. So why not just start with all features and find out what's best? Uh, yeah, yeah, great question. So uh, actually, we didn't have much time to, uh, you know, uh, dig into all the related uh, parameters. Were the 16 features that you did try, was there anything surprising about the results? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't get this question. For the 16 features that you did try, mm. was there anything surprising about the results? Like, did you actually learn something? Like, actually, now we should put 27 here instead of 15 or whatever, I don't know. Oh, 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 great question. So I don't think we noticed any surprise. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So if I understood the results right, like in the example of, of optimization you, you've had there, so it took you like 17 minutes to optimize the parameters here uh, to come up with better suggestion, let's say. So this is one of the, I would say, obstacles because uh, like it's a lot of CPU time yeah, for something that tends to be dynamic, like the workloads are constantly kind of changing. Yeah. So here you had like basically static workload, yeah, you are serving Nginx web pages, it's pretty non-changing workload. Uh, so for that you can take 17 minutes to optimize the parameters and fine tune it. And like obviously there are use cases where this is great, but like if you want to wire it up, as you said, to the in-kernel auto-optimization of the parameters, then as the workload changes on the machine, then 17 minutes is just, or if you had even more parameters to optimize, then the time would actually blow up to hours, yeah? And then it's not really practical that you take two hours or five hours to optimize the parameters only when the workload changes in 20 minutes, yeah? So that's, that's one of the problem. I'm not sure if you have some thoughts how to overcome this, because in kernel, we use these trivial heuristics exactly because they can react fast. Yeah, that, that's the, the whole point. Like if we had time and resources to do the complex analysis, then then sure, we we would be doing it. But because we are so resource constraints, constrained and the reactions need to be fast, that's why we use the trivial heuristics, which are obviously wrong in quite a few cases. But yeah, uh, and the use case we have actually, like I mentioned, is pretty simple. So we use, you know, some simple benchmark, not actually any uh, real workload. Yeah, so this is why, you know, I think it already makes some difference, you know, with such sort of, uh, uh, you know, a uh, uh, period of the training. Yeah, uh, and uh, I do believe, you know, when we have some uh, real and more complicated workload, definitely it probably takes more time. Uh, one thing that I'm particularly concerned about, like with machine learning model in general, but specifically in this context of like um, machine learning for kernel is that um, a lot of those models are essentially black box, right? You're going to have a really hard time like uh, interpret those models result when things go wrong and debugging kernel is already uh, complicated. So imagine if like, I don't know, we export like, um, bunch of knobs that you optimize for and then it regress our performance and now like now what right like uh have you considered any thoughts or opinions on that oh oh this is a great question yes i think uh, you know uh, uh um uh, machine learning is definitely not the um, uh, ideal solution i do believe you know there are some uh, uh disadvantages of, as well actually the paper i shared in the in my presentation, actually, that paper we did some uh, our own research. Actually, that did not uh, uh, this paper. This is the paper I uh, uh, mentioned. So this this paper actually uh, based on our experiment. Actually, it uh, uh, goes to a wrong direction. It could not work well. <laughs> yeah, we 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 tried. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have one more question. It's like. When you have this using this kernel, um, you know, machine learning, you get a better result. Um, have you ever also trying to see different areas, like you're maybe you're running different workload, maybe scenario changes? Does that, uh, you know, that tuning the result may not be the optimal one? This is my first question. Second one is like, uh, when you do you ever do a 
you know, insight analysis, see why this is better, right? Because of you have a longer, recurrent, uh, you know, network queues, because of you have better, more CPU resources, is that process, you know, uh, done in this paper or in this research? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, short answer, uh, not yet, because you know we only tried you know the uh, uh, simple cases we mentioned. So we are exploring more user cases. However, uh, uh, nothing uh, has finished yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I have a question about the uh, like the end product of the machine learning. So my understanding is that with the machine learning, you get a model which you can ask a question. For example, like if I have like four with CPU and two gigabyte memory, and what's the best uh, uh, kernel parameter I could choose for the Nginx uh, workload. So is that, but from your presentation, I think it's actually something different. Is you use that machine learning to do uh, automatic Current turning. So I, I just wonder that uh, does your method actually have this model to answer questions like for different VM size, different uh, memory, and uh, to give you the answer which of uh, which current parameter, parameter is the best, or you just uh, use that machine learning to tuning for a particular uh, VM size? Uh, I'm not quite sure if I understand your question correctly. So uh, the parameters are still selected by our uh, kernel engineers manually. And we also needed to uh, set some, you know, safe ranges for the different uh, parameters. In this case, you know, it uh, so, goes So my question speed. is that, uh, could you master use the data point from like one VM size, one, one, one CPU, one machine size, and uh, do a prediction for a different machine size? Can you master do that, handle that case? Is that handled by your, by your master? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, what aside? So, uh, I mean, can you use machine learning to uh, analyze data point for a particular uh, uh, VM size or, or machine size? That means, means the number of CPUs and the size of memories and uh, the uh, network hardware and uh, then it will give you an answer to like the best uh, curve parameter that you want to use, right? And then can you also use that same model for a different machine? Oh, 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 uh, uh, in my opinion, I don't think it's very related. However, you know, uh, maybe there are some complications within the kernel, like, you know, the um, uh, a watermark skill factor that is definitely related to the total memory we have. Okay. So it depends, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just a question from my side. I didn't understand the, like, the setup. Like, usually, like, there are a lot of workloads running, but you are optimizing for like, one, specific, one specific workload. So is, is the expectation here is like, there is one dominant workload among many that are running on the system, but you want one of them to behave better? Or is the algorithm going to optimize for all of them in one go? And there is the factor of all the noise that's happening in the background because, for instance, in one hour, maybe this is like the backup daemon we're running, which is not running all day long, which can impact all the tuning results. So like, is the expectation, I mean, the question, is this static or dynamic kind of system? Uh, actually, we simplify the problem here. Uh, we uh, isolated all the uh, performance testing in some uh, uh, virtual machine or container. Yeah. So. Uh, actually, I think the mixed workload is a very difficult problem to solve with machine learning. So if we want to tune multiple workloads together, you know, to meet multiple goals, this is very difficult in my opinion. It is difficult, but that's yeah. the, the practical way because you cannot isolate one workload in one machine, especially if you have like a newer machine for reserved for one <laughs> workload. That's not going to work out. Yep. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Questions, comments? Thanks for your presentation. We have been trying similar concept for years. I just want to predict four type of workloads. And last, you know, we tried for at least two years. We are not successful. 
I don't know how, what's your experience? Like he said, it's not about one workload. One workload is fine. But, you know, like in laptop or your system, you don't learn one workload. And what the problem we see is you predict something and you don't know how to back off. Because, you know, like you predicted, oh, I'm like bursty workload. But actually it is sustained workload because of something else. Then the whole prediction actually back misfires. That's, that's why it's important. It's not just one workload. It's just a mix of workload is the what you really want to do. Maybe a server, you know, your specialized servers is fine because you're only doing one thing. But in to wider deployment, that's the big challenge we have. Uh, so uh, in Python, actually, we have some uh, 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 service running uh, on the bare metal, and they are totally isolated. They don't share the uh, bare metal with any other yeah. workload in, in our uh, uh, cases. So actually, you know, the same five case I uh, 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 have in the presentation is not unrealistic. It's real for uh, at least for our case. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. This uh, might be more of a question about the literature of kernel auto-tuning than particularly the talk, um, but this slide is actually a really good example of it. Uh, there's, um, I imagine some people have also tried to use non-statistical ways of doing kernel auto-tuning. And the first thing that I came to mind uh, as an alternative when I looked at this diagram was just a PID controller. And I was curious, and I'm sure there's lots of reasons to use possibly machine learning over non-statistical techniques of, to use, you know, traditional control systems instead. Um, but what advantages does a machine learning provide that these traditional control systems are not gonna be able to provide? Uh, uh, to, uh, to be honest, actually, I don't understand, you know, the PID controller stuff here. However, I do mention, you know, there are some uh, uh, comparisons with the traditional one. I think the machine learning could uh, uh, have more opportunities than the traditional one. So in, very in general. Control the PID control variable. You, one control variable works. You have 15, 16 control variables. Then it falls apart. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. In your talk, you, you were mentioning that you would like to move that in the kernel. The only reason is to have access to more variables. That's only that? Or do you have other or the interest of moving this all this phase in the kernel? Because I, I'm not sure that which kind of benefit that will provide you to be in the kernel compared to right now being in user space and using this kind of uh, CCFS uh, parameter, for example. Well, wh why would you like to go to, to the kernel instead of just staying in user space for doing your machine learning? Uh... I think I uh, mentioned here about you know whether we should use uh, machine learning in kernel space or uh, the euro space. Uh, let's see. Uh, so basically here, so you know there are different uh, uh, pros and cons we need to consider whether we. So and when you need say more real time ends, uh -huh. what do you mean exactly? Kernel compared to being in user space. Oh, 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 by this point, actually, I mean, you know, when we need to make some decision, if we do that in kernel space, we don't have to go back, go going up to the uh, user space and make a decision and get it back. So there is some latency. Yeah. That's it. That work, and then it's done, and you you you're not touching anymore your your parameter. So, okay. I'm not. I, I don't. I'm not sure to see the benefit of this real-time capture of the parameter compared to being in user space. It can be in user space and being quite efficient as well. Uh, I think you can think about the network congestion control. So you know, the, all the congestions and connections will probably change within many seconds or something. If we go back to the user space, I think that will uh, possibly, you know, uh, not that accurate. Methods of changing real time. So, like you, 
it looks like the parameters are actually then changing constantly. So like it's not like you have a set of values, you set them once and you can uh, I think for the you can change in milliseconds time frames. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I think for the congestion control, we definitely need to update the parameters very frequently, like the uh, congestion control window. So towards this direction, I think it's hard to get if the web server is better than worse. For that, you need to do a, a lot of data massage to figure out that it's trending upwards that that the user space somehow. So I mean, this is an expensive operation. So somehow you need to have this data in user space that you are going to consume in kernel space to why not the other way around? Space. Yeah, this is a good point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, if we move, you know, the machine learning into the current space, we also possibly need to transfer the data from the Euro space. Yes, that's true. Thank you. Well, that's, we're running out of time. And, uh, thank you, Kong. Thank you.